This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes and will be an application of the fibered product we studied last lecture to group schemes. So we're just going to use fibered products to, to define what a group scheme is. So let's just recall the definition of a group. So a group consists of a set G and it has a product which we'll denote as a multiplication from G times G to G. And it has an identity, which will be a map E from one to G, where one is the set with one element, as you can probably guess. And it has an inverse map minus one from G to G. And these satisfy various axioms. And I'm going to write down the axioms in a slightly funny way. So the axioms, um, there's an associativity axiom, which says that if you take a product of three copies of G, you can map it to two copies of G in two different ways. You can either take the identity map of G times the product. In other words, you multiply these two and then take it to G, or you can multiply the first two and um, to get that one and, and just take the identity map on the third one. And then these two, you just apply the product. And the associativity axiom just says this diagram commutes. And the identity axiom is similar. So we have a map from G times one to G times G, which is just um, the identity map on G um, times the... Um, so the, 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 the identity map from G to itself times the, 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 the map from one to G and G times one can be identified with G. And then we've got a multiplication map here. So this diagram has to commute and there should be a diagram for the inverse, which looks, takes G to G times G to one to G. And um, if I try and fill in these, I'll probably get them wrong, so I won't. And there should be two similar diagrams because um, we want the identity to be a left identity and a right identity and want the inverse to be left inverses and right inverses. So this is a rather slightly strange way of defining a group. The point of it, this makes sense for any category with products and a final element one. So a final element just means an element such that any thing in the category has a unique morphism to it. Um, so if a category has finite has, has a product of two elements, then it has a product of any positive finite number of elements. And you can think of the final element as being the product of the empty set of elements. So, so the category has a product of any finite, possibly empty set of elements, and then you can define groups. For example, you can just take the category of topological spaces, that has products, and a group in the category of topological spaces is just a topological group. Anyway, it should be pretty obvious what we're going to do. We're going to define groups in the category of schemes. So we can define groups in the category of schemes, because as we showed last lecture, we have a concept of product of schemes. Well, actually this is not a terribly useful construction. Better is we can define groups in the category of schemes over some fixed scheme S. So this is a, this is a much more useful. Um, now, if G is a group scheme over S, by which we mean a group in the category of schemes over S, then we can look at morphisms from any um, element of the schemes over S to G. So the morphisms 
from T to G um, over S form a group which we denote by G of T. And we think of it as being the points of the group with values in the scheme S. If um, T is the spectrum of a ring, we put G of R to be the same as G of T by abuse of notation. So, so G is a functor from um, schemes or possibly rings over S to groups. It's actually a covariant function of rings and a contravariant function of schemes. Okay, this seems to be a rather abstract way of looking at um, groups, but in fact, it's very natural. For example, we could just put, um, let G to be the um, um, group scheme such that G of a ring is just the additive group of a ring R. Um, um, let's work over, let's take S to be the spectrum of Z. We'll just work over Z for, for, to make things a little bit simpler so we can sort of forget about S. Um, so, um, so, so here we've defined G as a functor from rings to groups. Um, in order to show that it's a scheme, we've got to show that this functor is actually represented by something, and it's pretty obvious what it's represented by. So the underlying scheme of S is just the spectrum of Z of X. Um, because you can see that the um, homomorphisms of rings from Z of X to R is just the same as R. So, so taking, taking any ring to its additive group is indeed a representable functor. So, um, so, the so, so we get a group whose underlying scheme is spec of Z of R. Furthermore, we've got a maps from G times G to G and from G to G, to G and from um, one to G where, where this means S which happens to be the spectrum of Z in this particular case. So these all correspond to homomorphisms between the corresponding rings. So here we've got a map from Z of X to Z of X tensor Z of X. And you can figure out that it's the map that just takes X to X tensor one plus one tensor X. Similarly, here we have a map from Z of X to Z of X, which just takes X to minus X. And here we've got a map from Z of X to Z, which you can work out just takes X to zero. So these are the three um, maps that give the group structure on this scheme. Um, so uh, what can we do with this? Well, one thing we can do with it is, is change the base. So G is a scheme over the spectrum of Z. And we can take another scheme mapping to the spectrum of Z. For instance, we could take spec of FP because there's a map from Z onto a finite field of order P. And we can now take the pullback of this. So we can take G tensor over spec of Z times spectrum of FP as the product. Of course, there's no real point in putting spec Z in, in, in this particular example because any scheme has a unique map to spectrum of Z. However, the idea is that um, we're just working over spec Z for simplicity and you should think that we can put in any scheme here and any other scheme here and sort of pull back a group over the first scheme to a, to a group scheme over the second scheme. So we have started with a group scheme over spec Z and by using the pullback, we've now got a group scheme over spec of FP. Well, it's, it's pretty easy to work out what it is in this particular case. So here, this is going to have underlying um, spectrum, just the spectrum of FP of X, because this just corresponds to reducing things mod P in this particular, particularly easy case. And the group multiplication maps will be given by essentially the same formulas as as we have here. 
Well, another thing we can do with it is take this group scheme here and take a subgroup of it. So let's put alpha p of r to be the elements of r, elements x of r, with x to the p equals zero under addition. So this is, this is a group. Well, it's a group provided we remember to take r to be an algebra over fp. So we're really taking, um, so this is going to be a group scheme over fp. And so, so, so this is a functor so far, and we want to know if it's actually represented by a scheme. Um, well, it is because we can take the scheme spec of fp of x over x to the p. And you can see that the, 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 the morphisms from, from the spectrum of R to the spectrum of fpx over x to the p uh, can be identified with the elements in R with x to the p equals naught. Um, and um, there's a map from um, um, this to the spectrum of fp of x. Um, so this is a closed subscheme of this scheme here. And we can think of this as being a closed subgroup or a closed subgroup scheme of, of the additive group we defined earlier. Um, it's actually finite because we see that um, alpha p maps the spectrum of fp is a finite morphism and it's a finite morphism because fp of x over x to the p is a finite module over fp. So we think of this as being a finite group scheme. Um, it's sort of somewhat analogous to a finite group, except it's not quite a group because it's a scheme. And we, we say its order is equal to the dimension of fp of x over x to the p as an fp vector space. Of course, it's easy to define the order because we're working over, over a field. If we were working over a more general scheme, we'd have to think more carefully about what the order is defined as. So this dimension is just P. So we can think of this group scheme as being a group scheme of order P. It sort of behaves in some ways as if it had P elements. Um, and it's a little bit weird because if you look at fp of x, we notice that this has nil potent elements. So th this is the, 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 the spectrum of this is a non-reduced scheme. And if you look at um, how we defined it, we were defining it just as a fibered product of two things over spectrum of Z. And you can see this is non-reduced. This is, sorry, this is reduced. This is reduced and this is reduced, but this fibered product is not reduced. So this gives another example of how taking products of reduced schemes without nil potents may still give you nil potents. We had an example of this last lecture when we were fiddling around with tensor products of fields. Um, so, so we, we've got a funny group scheme of order two over the finite field of order P. In fact, there are two other ways to produce group schemes of order P. One is a, a, a discrete group. Let's just define the group Z over PZ. 
So Z over PZ is an ordinary honest group. And we could just take a scheme consisting of P um, discrete points and just make these into a group. So this gives us a perfectly good group scheme. Um, and um, its, um, its coordinate ring is going to be, well, you, you, you just take the ring A and then you take elements A1, A2, up to AP, such that AI, AJ is equal to naught, AI squared equals AI, and the sum of the AI is equal to one. So we can think of AI as being the function that's naught on, the, on most of the points, except it's one on the ith points and naught on all the others. Um, and um, you can do this, you, you can make this into a group scheme over Z. In fact, you can do the same thing for any finite group whatsoever. You can turn a finite group into a group scheme. Notice, by the way, that Z over PZ of a ring R need not have, um, have um, P points. Um, so, for example, if R is connected, so, so if, if R has no um, idempotence other than one or zero, um, so if R has idempotence not equal to zero or one, then this um, may have more than P elements in it. So. Uh, although the group scheme has order p, its values in a ring R might have more than p elements. Um, and there's a third group you can form. This time, we're going to take the multiplicative group. So we're going to take the multiplicative group is going to be a functor taking any ring R to the group of non-zero elements. As before, this is represented by the spectrum of z of x, x to the minus one, because homomorphisms of this to any ring just correspond to the invertible elements of the ring. And the map from gm times gm to gm corresponds to a map from this to the tensor product with itself. And you can see that just takes x to x tensor with x and um, the inverse map from GM to GM just corresponds to the map taking x to x to the minus one, and the identity map just corresponds to the map taking x to one. Um, and this also has a closed subgroup called mu p, to be, which is the pth roots of unity. And this is represented by the spectrum of z of x over x to the p minus 1, which you can see is a, a sort of subscheme of the spectrum of z of x, x to the minus 1, because this is a, is a quotient of, of, of this ring. Um, and again, we can reduce mod p. So we look at mu p over the field fp. In other words, we're just we, we're just going to reduce everything mod p, and by being very sloppy, we're still going to call this mu p. So its its spectrum is fp of x over x to the p minus one. And if you look at this, this is again a non-reduced scheme. It's f of p x over x minus one to the p. And here we see there are some nilpotent elements. So, um, so mu of p is just the pth roots of one. This means that mu p of r is the pth roots of one in r. So we found three different group schemes, alpha p, mu p, and z over p z. So this takes any ring r to, um, well, any ring r without um, idempotence 
to the cyclic group of order P. This takes a, a ring R over the field with P elements to P through its of one, and this takes a ring R over the finite field with P elements to the um, elements whose pth power is zero. Um, and I'm going to leave a sort of exercise about these three groups. That Cartier duality. Now, if we've got a um, um, if we've got a ring, suppose spectrum of R is a group scheme. Well, the ring comes with maps R tends R to R, which is its multiplication, um, and it comes with a map from one to R, which is just the identity element of R. And the group structure gives us a map from R to R tensor R, and a map from R to one, which corresponds to the multiplication and the identity of the group. And finally, we have this inverse map from R to R. Now suppose R is a finite dimensional vector space over a field K. What we can do is we look at, uh, look at its dual R star, which are just the linear maps from R to K. And now you notice that um, if we dualize all these, if we dualize this map, we get a map of this form involving R star instead. So by dualizing R, we find we still, sorry, this is a, this means the dual, not the non-zero elements of it. So, so R star is still spectrum. So, 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 so spectrum of R star is also an algebraic group scheme. Because you can check that all the, um, the, the, the sort of axioms for a ring are kind of dual to the axioms for a group. So if we've got any group, any group scheme um, coming from a finite dimensional algebra over a field, you can just, just take the dual of this and get another group scheme that's a finite dimensional algebra over a scheme. And the exercise that I'm going to end with is to figure out what's the dual of these three groups. It turns out the dual of each of these groups is, is another one of these three groups. Um, so I'll leave it to you to work out which is which. So next lecture, we're going to move on and discuss the property of a scheme or a morphism of schemes being separable, which is an analog of a topological space being Hausdorff.